Great. So welcome everyone. I'm so glad you were able to make it to our first Insider Speaker event. I am really pleased to have Abby King with us. I first met Abby way back in 2011. We were on a blogger trip in Spain so many years ago. And uh, since then I've been tracking her work, seeing her over the years here and there. But uh, uh, I think she just makes the perfect first speaker for us given our current times. Um, she, was, she is a former ER doctor who became a travel writer, which gives her a very unique perspective on travel, one that we can't get from many people. She's an award-winning author and journalist and broadcaster and founder of Inside the Travel Lab, uh, which is described by National Geographic Traveler as essential reading. She first studied neuroscience at the University of, of Cambridge before completing her medical degree and working in intensive care and ER for the better part of a decade. And then she swapped the wards for the world. She's traveled to over 60 countries and spoken at UNESCO headquarters, the EU and NASA. So aren't we lucky to have her here? Welcome, welcome, Abby. Thank you. What a lovely introduction, <laughs> Janice. Thank you. Yes, I'm really, really, really pleased that you said yes to our invitation. It's, uh, it's such a difficult time right now, and uh, it's just really, re really need your expertise as both a medical doctor and a traveler. So I think it's just perfect. But before we get going, I want people to know a bit more about you. So we're going to do a fun little starting point to get to know you as a traveler. Okay. So this is a series of kind of either or questions. So when you're traveling, are you more inclined to urban or nature? Ooh, nature. Now, I think I used to be a lot more urban, but I have to say coming out of 16 weeks lockdown, I really crave the open skies and seas now. Right. Yeah, yeah. I was always an urban traveler up until maybe actually about when I started the blog and then okay. I've switched okay. to nature. I mean, I like, I still go to cities, Yeah. But, uh, but that's when I discovered I grew up in cities and never thought about nature and then <laughs> discovered it on one of my first trips. So it was great. Okay. So carry on or more when you're packing? More and definitely more. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I would like to rationalize it. And so the excuse that I give is, you know, well, I need my camera gear and my tripod and my microphones because, you know, it's work. But ultimately, I think I, I like to have a range of options for stuff when I go somewhere. And also, I always like the option to bring something back. So I find it pretty hard to just be carry on only. Um, okay. Yeah. And then in the travel community, that's a little bit of a <laughs> sort of dirty <laughs> secret. Most people are really like, no, as little as possible. You know, they travel for three months with, you know, one bag this size. That's, that's not me. I'm, I'm huge. I'm at the back trailing all this stuff. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, what's your, prefer your preferred mode of uh, transportation? Plane, train, car, bike? Well, I live in Britain. So we're in Ireland, obviously, so I don't normally have all that many options. So it's normally flying. But these days, probably a road trip, again, particularly with the coronavirus thing going on. Driving, I think, is my favourite way right now. Okay. And budgets are usually a factor for us in some way. Yeah. Um, where would you save and where would you splurge? If you think of like you, the, the broad categories, flights, accommodation, food, where would you, spl where would you save and where would you splurge? Um, I haven't got a good answer for this. You got me on the spot because I'd always go for the experience. So sometimes that's one uh, of accommodation and sometimes it's food, depends on where you are. So if, you know, somewhere like Thailand or Italy, I kind of don't need to worry about spending money on food because the food's going to be amazing anyway. Um, so then I might splurge perhaps to stay in a historic building rather than in a sort of cheaper, you know, place in town. That's how I work it out, really. Um, I'm always after the best experience that I can get. Yes. Yeah. So it's experience, which means that the flight or it doesn't, that's not a big factor then. 
it's not mostly, but for long haul, I mean, if I can make it happen, then I would like a flat bed. I'm less bothered by the other trappings of first class or business class. But if it's a really long haul flight and I land in the morning and I think, actually, my whole first day is somewhere I'm going to be feeling ropey, particularly as I get old. <laughs> I noticed, like, I didn't think about it at all when I was 21. Um, then that rises in priority. But it's normally such a jump that, no, I'd save my money for the ground. Okay, and just finally, if time travel were possible, would you go backward or forward? I love this question. I would go backwards. That was an easy one. I like to keep the surprise for the future. Um, and I got so many questions about the past. I love so much about history. Um, I want to have a bit of control about where I went. You know, you wouldn't want to pitch up in the middle of a battleground or as a <laughs> like, scullery maid in a sort of Victorian slum around here or something. But yeah, I think there's, there's lots to explore in the past and then I can keep the future kind of as a nice surprise. That's fun. That's fun. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we've got I've got one with Tracy's with me on the luggage. Hooray! <laughs> I'm not alone after all. Thank you, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get on to the topic at hand, and that is travel during the time of coronavirus. Um, broadly speaking, do you think it makes sense to travel right now? Broadly speaking, uh, you've got to divide yourself into sort of four W's, I think. Who you are, where you are, where you're going, and why. Um, because... I think there are great opportunities for travel. There are also terrible ones. Um, and so when we're talking to everybody in the world, I'd sort of say, you know, where are you? Are you in the middle of a hotspot um, for coronavirus? In which case, you know, we all know we shouldn't be going anywhere. Where do you want to go? Um, is that a hotspot? Because you probably shouldn't be going there. I mean, those are kind of basic ones, aren't they? But then it's who and why. And who, I don't know about the states and Canada, which is where you guys are from, I know more about the UK news. We hear a lot about talk about over 70s and people with very various chest complaints and stuff like that who should be more worried. But I think there's also a who check in, in terms of finances and things. So it's very rapidly involving situation. And a lot of the rules have changed with a couple of hours notice here in Europe in terms of borders closing or quarantine being imposed. And so, for some people that is fine. Some people are happy to take the risk because they could financially suddenly pay for an extra two weeks accommodation or they could work from home when they get back. Or if they're a solo traveler, this is one time actually where it is much easier. But if say I'm traveling for work and I've left my daughter behind, I don't want to be trapped behind a border for up to six weeks away from her. So those are very personal. Um, and then the why, which often is personal too, isn't it? I mean, why are you going, if you've got something that you could do that's just as well at home, maybe do that. But I've got a lot of, you know, at some point, what are you waiting for and what are you protecting yourself for? And I've got a lot of people who have certain medical illnesses and they're not sure how many more years they have left. Um, and if all other things are equal, it's safe for them to go now. Maybe they should go now. Um, and maybe they should take the risk. And that brings me back to a beautiful article I read of yours, actually, Janice, many, many years ago, 10 years ago, that comes back to the question of, should I stay or should I go? I don't know if you remember the piece. That was yeah. a very long time ago, that's right. Yeah, a long, long time ago, but it's really, really stuck with me. And I would recommend that we probably put that link in under here. It's nothing about coronavirus, because it was years ago, but I thought you handled really well is the question of balancing you know, quite apart from that, do I stay? Do I go? Is it a risk to stay? Is it a risk to put my dreams on hold forever? Um, which is a valuable risk, but you don't want to be reckless either and just go, well, I want to do something, so I'm going to do it. You know, I don't think that's the right path to take. And I thought you've got a really useful structure that I think it applies now because from a medical point of view, coronavirus isn't really that different to to anything else there are health risks whenever we travel and there are health risks if we never do anything at all you know if we just sit at home and never see anybody and never leave our house then that brings with it health problems so from a medical point of view things haven't really changed what's changed is the political response um, which is often a little bit panicky 
um, that means we need to think a little bit more health as usual, but also we now need finance and jobs. You know, if you have to get back to work on Monday morning and you'll lose your job if there's a sudden quarantine imposed, then maybe that's not for you to go. Whereas if you can work from home or if you're retired, well, you don't have to worry about that. So that's my, <laughs> that's my structure. Yeah, so it's the, it's the four W's. Yeah. Right? Um, where, why? Two where's, where you are and right. where you're going. That's right, that's yeah. right. Yeah, if you are in a hot spot, leaving that hot spot is irresponsible to, for where you're going to. Yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah, so you could be taking harm to people that, you know, where you're visiting. Yeah. Where you're going, you don't want to go to a hot spot either. Yeah. Yeah, and then the who and the why. But it is, like you say, it's, it's very personal. Like, there are a lot oh, of... Hugely, yeah. And um, people are spread all around the world now, so people have relatives all around the world, and that's a big driver for a lot of people's travel. And... You know, people are thinking now as this rolls on, well, if I don't go now, when perhaps, like where I am now, the cases are currently very low. A lot of people are thinking, well, now's the time to go before they ramp up again. You know, if I haven't seen my grandchildren or my mother or my cousin or, you know, now's the time to move house. There are lots of different reasons as well. Yeah. Um, and then there's finally, then there's how, which is probably what we'll talk about more, how you can reduce your risk, basically when you travel as well yeah yeah um so every everyone who responded wanted to go someplace that would require a flight yes what sorry bear with me a moment i'm just going to close the door here i'll be right back <laughs> okay <laughs> so uh what is it like to fly now in terms of risk um so flights are pretty good for many reasons. They're very well regulated, they're very well structured, and they're run by very well trained crews. The, from what I've read, the air filtration systems are pretty good. But you can't get away from the fact that you can't socially distance on a flight and at various points in the airport. So it is a, an increased risk to staying at home or doing a road trip. Um, whether or not that is a risk that's worth taking for you goes back to sort of what I've said before. I haven't flown anywhere, but I've spoken to lots of people who have. Lots of airlines are giving out a lot of masks and visors and gloves. They won't get rid of all your risk, but they will reduce it. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, on the balance of things, if you're in a position where if the rules change, you're going to be okay, I would say, if you can fly, go. If it's too unsafe, the authorities will stop it. I mean, they're not perfect, but they probably do a better job than any of us trying to read the headlines and work out the risk ourselves. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah if, you, if you look at the travel advisories on the government websites, for example, yeah. they are often, um, they get, the advisors get up there fast and they're yeah. typically slow to remove them. Yes. I mean, most places are very cautious. Most governments are very cautious. So I think if there is no restriction, then, then go, is my personal take on it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess for me personally, I would also be thinking in terms of, um, you know, coming home and the self-isolation for two weeks, which would be, which is required in Canada. Right. Uh, yeah. So, and, and to make sure that I'm not bringing anything to the people that I love here as well, yeah. not yeah. only to the population in general being responsible socially, but also to within my family. So that needs to be considered if the destination that you've chosen has a two week quarantine and then coming home as a two week quarantine, <laughs> you have to have a lot of time at your disposal. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's not for a lot of people, but then if that's not an issue for you, then perhaps now is a good time. You know, you'll get a quieter time in Europe. You'll see something different. Um, as long as you behave responsibly, which I'm sure, you know, people tuning into something as <laughs> run by you will be, but then, yeah. 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 I mean, at the moment we have a lot of advice against flying from the UK. So, and they change it quite quickly. So, I think that means if, if they're not saying there's a problem, then, then you're free to go. 
right yeah yeah and there are there are certainly opportunities around traveling right now because the number of people traveling is so much lower so that you can really can you can kind of dig into a destination in a very different way than you can if there are crowds so there's, there's yeah definitely sides. yeah yeah so um getting to the how right and the gear and what we can do uh as we travel to to put us in you know the best step possible yeah, so um, at the start, I'll just say in terms of the gear that you should pack to take with you, I've put together a list and we'll put the link in at the end on the blog. So there's a, a handy list there that you can get for the stuff that you take on the flight or in your bags. In terms of how you get around, you know, a road trip is definitely the safest because you can isolate yourself completely in your car and then do contactless check in and things like that. Then flights where, of course, you're going to mix with people, but it's very, very well regulated. And then at the bottom of that is one of my favourite ways to get around normally, which is sort of by train. But I mean, that's a little bit of a, a wild west at the moment. You're going to be with lots of different people. It isn't very well regulated. I would probably, my personal, and it's only my personal advice, would be to stay away from that for now. Mm. Um, See, now that's it depends on where you are, but yeah. Yes, yeah, I was going to say that's interesting because in the UK there are many different rail providers. Yes. Right? There are many different operators, whereas in North America, in the US, Amtrak, and in Canada, Via Rail. And I looked into both of them, and they both have uh, very, very similar protocols. I think it's enough. I, you know, I was impressed with what they had, but you're right. You are, you know, within. And you have different people getting on and off the journey. Whereas with a flight, you have the same people and you have the filtered air in a flight. That's an interest. Those, yeah. those are two interesting yeah. points. But I mean, it's all, it's all about relative risk. If you're taking the train in an area that has no cases, then you're probably fine. But I would just rank them very much like that at the moment, your own private car flights and then any kind of public transport yeah no that's that's actually yeah i hadn't thought about the air filtration system in the in the trains not just not being there the yeah same. yeah it's a big difference because the hepa filter and in, in that's working in the planes are supposed to be really good yeah I, I think it goes against my instincts and it's not my area of expertise but from what i've looked at from aviation it does look pretty good the danger isn't particularly from the shared air on a flight it's you know the person staggering back from the toilet who lifts their mask back and coughs over you whilst you're having your lunch you know I and mean, you just <laughs> you shouldn't never go anywhere because that might happen but i mean that's the risk isn't it on a plane and on a train whereas when you're in the car no one's going to do that to you, you know, you're okay that's yeah right. that's right oh. okay uh, and, and the gear. yeah the gear so i'll talk about flying more I don't know if anyone's been on any flights yet or anything like that I don't want to talk too long if no do you know I mean if you all already know this <laughs> I don't want to witter on at you okay so um you're gonna to have to get there much earlier from I've heard there's the queues are spread out and there's lots more checks around the place you're gonna to have to really 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 double check all your small print because it's changing really fast and I know there's certainly stories of other bloggers who've been turned away at the airport for various reasons because the rules have changed from when they left to when they got there I mean that's pretty bad luck but it just means that you need to check in terms of what you need to keep yourself safe the number one thing really is the hand sanitizer you are gonna need a mask that is much more to protect other people than it is to you but you're going to need several masks um particularly on a long-haul flight they get quite grubby and they get soaked through and then they stop protecting as well now it depends what the mask's made of um as to how long it's effective for but it won't be effective for the full length of a flight so with that you're going to need something to put your clean masks in the one you're using and your dirty ones yeah. so um perhaps as the mum of a three-year-old right now, we have nappy sacks or diaper bags, they might be in the US. So they're like small plastic bags. It doesn't feel great for the environment, but it does protect, you know, you can put your dirty mask in there, you keep your clean, you wash your hands, and then you get a clean one. Um, because one of the worst, one of the problems about masks is once you've worn them, you've gathered a lot, a lot of the germs on the mask. 
So if people then put them on the table or in their pocket or on their lap, then they're just transferring the virus particles there and then you just touch your face without thinking about it and you've actually got, you know, that's how things spread. I've explained that badly because it's your germs back to you. But I mean, if you put it on the table and then someone else touches the table, you'll have spread something to them and vice versa. So you should be having your little bags there. Um, oh, I've just seen a message about, oh, okay, nothing unusual other than masks. Um, some airlines are also giving you masks or gloves or visors, but some aren't. Those are the main things that you'd need, but I think I've also got others as a good idea. And that would be your own water bottle. Um, so you don't get dehydrated, you know, if they come around with the same bottle or something like that, you've got your own water bottle, your own cutlery, um, which is, you can get gorgeous bamboo sets that are lovely and eco-friendly, or you can just put your own cutlery in your bag. That's just as good. Wet wipes and alcohol wipes for those things. Because when something goes, when you touch your face and nose, or when something goes into your mouth, is your highest chance to actually pick up the virus yourself, any sort of airborne virus. So if you can be a bit fastidious about that moment, then that's what can help protect you. Then if you're going to travel these days, traveling these days, you're gonna need a thermometer because um, it takes a lot of the guesswork out. If you're thinking, oh, I've got a raised temperature, am I just feeling hot? Is it because the air conditioning in this room? You can just take your temperature. And some places are insisting that you take them now. So I got a press release from Bermuda, the island of Bermuda, and they won't let you in without your own thermometer. And, and a lot of cash. This is another thing to check. A lot of countries have said, well, okay, we'll only let you in if you can prove that you can cover the cost of your quarantine and get yourself out if you are infected and get a test and all the rest of this. But that's not gear to protect you, that's just gear you might need depending on where you're going. Um, snacks and food I think are always a good idea but now more than ever because a lot of restaurants are closed, some airlines stop their in-flight service and, oh, sorry I'm trying to read the messages at the same time, Oh yeah, I'll come to the test bit. Uh, but with snacks and food, it's just really good to have options uh, so that if, you know, the food come round and you think, actually, I'm not sure about the way they're cutting it and handling it, or they don't come round, <laughs> um, or you get somewhere. And at the moment in the UK, our restaurants have only just opened up, but you have to book and it's socially distanced. So if you turn up as a new traveller, then you might not be able to get in anywhere for an evening. Um, particularly the first night you get somewhere when you're still finding your feet um, because the number of people they can fit in is reduced. So, so I would bring snacks with you, nothing messy. So things like granola bars or something that's really been useful to me over the years is some, I don't know if you can, I guess you can get them everywhere, like packets of dehydrated couscous. They're really lightweight, they're really flat, and they go, go in your suitcase. This is why I'm an overpacker. Um, and then Thank if you. you're... <laughs> what? Handy. Couscous. Do you have... It's like originally from Morocco. It's very popular in the UK now. But it rehydrates really quickly. So it's like a nice version of a pot noodle. So if you're in a hotel, you can get some hot water into your coffee cup. Like, you know, worst case scenario. But we're living in uncertain times and sometimes yeah the restaurants close there's no room service whatever um and you know it's a passable meal and particularly if you have any you know medical issues that are going to give you trouble if you get dehydrated or hungry then it's something i've found useful over the years <laughs> it's like spilling all my secrets <laughs> um and I think that is about it. I will just check the messages that have popped up. Ah, so, so Anne has been flying. Uh, oh no, sorry, Anne hasn't. Um, oh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Name. Is Zen Zenaida, is that right? Yeah, I think it's Zenaida. Zenaida has flown Berlin to Estonia. Ah, nothing unusual apart from masks. Oh, that is surprising. I thought they were doing different cues. How long does a mask last from Laurie? Um, well, look, it depends. I mean, strictly from a medical point of view, uh, they're probably only at their best for about 15 to 20 minutes, but that's probably a bit excessive for people to keep 
changing all the time because most people aren't paying any attention to that. I would probably change it every three hours. Certainly if it starts feeling wet, like wet to the touch on your face, then it's not doing you any good and it's not really protecting very well anymore. So I would change it. So probably, you know, for a 12 hour flight, I vague rule of thumb, probably three or four masks for your comfort and for, you know, trying to keep it as effective as you can. Um, ah, negative. Does it matter oh, whether it's the paper masks that one buys or the cloth masks that people make? Uh, I asked my, my sister this. She's, I'm very lucky. She's a consultant in virology here in Wales and is running the response to the whole virus. So I've picked her brain. She says, I mean, she says, to be honest, it doesn't matter. The really good masks are not available to the public because they're in short supply. The ones that will really stop. Uh, anything getting in and I think that's fair enough we all understand that so the ones that we've got are kind of a it's not quite a token gesture it's just doing a little bit that you can so her advice is don't stress about it so long as there's some kind of covering then you're you're playing your part um yeah um and we have to leave the high grade ones for the hospital workers mm -hmm. um let's have a look oh the negative covid tests Yes, so lots of different places have got very different rules at the moment about COVID testing. Some are asking for results done 48 hours or 72 hours before you get on the flight and some are insisting you get them done when you get to the airport and lots of places aren't doing anything at all and there's a, all three of them actually do make sense to me um, because there isn't a perfect, there just isn't a perfect solution. That's up to the country and airlines are normally pretty good at checking with you when you check in that you've fulfilled everything, but it's not actually their responsibility. So again, you need to check and get the writing done. But there are different tests with different levels of certainty and that's why there are different rules. Mm -hmm. And on the subject of cash, most European countries encourage you to come with credit or debit cards. Yes. So here in Cardiff, it's currently now very rare to pay with cash at all. Almost everywhere has gone contactless. It's the same in Canada, is it? Yeah, very much, yeah. 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 But still a few places, um, particularly rural places, I think you probably, it's a good idea to have some cash with you. But I would keep your cash reserves pretty low these days. Um, but it depends also where you're going in Europe. You sometimes still need cash for the kind of, you know the dodgy scenarios when someone says they need it to protect your car and things like that then they're not going to take a contactless payment you're going to have to just give them some cash but that's i don't know to my experience that's normally across southern europe more than the north so um have a little bit but not a lot i would say um yeah let me just check if there's anything more on my on my list um oh yes one other thing that I've seen is some airlines are saying you have to you have to pack really light <laughs> um, <laughs> really really light so smaller than the normal hand luggage or carry-on um, so again that's just down to checking with your airline their rationale is they hate the queues where everybody's you know struggling with the overhead locker and pulling it out and back in again and leaning over they want everybody to go in quick sit down face the same way to kind of reduce transmission. So that's just something to check. You know, if you think, oh, I always fly with this airline, check it, because it might have changed. Um, and finally, I had down some sort of facial cleanser and more sunscreen than usual, because the mask will rub and irritate at your skin. And so you're gonna need to properly wash your face and you're gonna be using sunscreen a bit more than usual, I would say, as a result as well, because you keep rubbing it off. Would never have thought of that. My list <laughs> from my overpacking days. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, there's a lot of good information in there that I would like a lot that I would not have thought of. And what about this the shield, the screen? Um oh, mask me, yeah. <laughs> that's that's it. Thank you, Tracy. If you haven't seen that on the chat, yeah. You get spots, you get kind of acne from it. Mask me, <laughs> mask me. Um sorry, the visors. Well, I think they are great there are not as many clinical studies completed on them yet so we're not sure how effective they are compared to the masks they might be better they might be worse um but they're a bit harder to pack i really you know fingers crossed hope that they work 
as well because I think they're much better for facial expression and for people understanding each other and the biggest thing you see people doing wrong with masks and it, you see a lot um, is lifting it to speak because it's hard to understand and that <laughs> I mean all the time I see people doing this and it's completely missing the point so at least with the visors people don't don't tend to do that but yeah. right right oh, okay that's that's great what about uh the etiquette of travel during this time I mean, uh, there must be things that i mean just in terms of a sensitivity of what a different you know different countries are going through and what they're they're culturally adjust how they're culturally adjusting to things or is there a universal etiquette for this bit of both. I think there should be a universal etiquette around social distancing and I think we should now be accepting sadly as normal that you know we don't shake hands, we don't hug and kiss, we don't do things like that anymore. What I've noticed, so I live in Wales, um, very close to the border within in England and when our lockdown for crossing the border ended, I've been there a few times and things are very different there because their lockdown lifted much earlier. So just on that micro level, I've noticed a big cultural difference in terms of how people behave. Um, here in Wales, we're much more distanced, we're much more conservative. So I suppose it's often just to be mindful, um, mindful of that. I haven't been able to travel much because we've been locked down. Um, but in general, in Europe, particularly Northern Europe, people have a lot of trouble with being direct I think I would say as compared to the US in particular and Canada and so don't don't wait for somebody to tell you not to do something because they might really struggle with it I'm not sure if that's the sort of cultural thing that you might be asking um, I think probably the US and Canadian way is a lot healthier to be honest you know you're a lot more direct you're a lot more say what you mean and you'll say what's upsetting you and bothering you or ask someone to move along or ask someone to put a mask on whereas certainly in Britain people struggle with that and France to an extent yeah. um, and some of the Scandinavian countries so I guess just I mean just do the stuff that you would normally be doing as a decent person anyway observe social distancing contactless when you can uh, don't pull your mask off to <laughs> lean over and shout at somebody, like, shout at somebody. Um, yeah. but our Canadians will ask politely, then apologise. Yeah, see, so that's that's a lot more similar to to Britain. <laughs> I think, yeah, and I'm almost a bit nervous to exist. Um, <laughs> but so, I think that's probably the only the kind of thing to pick up the cues from people around you. But again, that's the kind of advice that I'm sure we've all been trying our best to follow. Yeah. Anyway, during normal travel, isn't it? You know. Yeah, for sure. And making mistakes along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Are there um, are there any other questions that are coming in from people, or do, you, uh, do we have anything else from anybody, Tracy? Do we have anything else that we've missed? Looks like looks like you've uh, pretty well covered it. I've gone through. Um, well, if we've got a little bit more time, um, I don't know if it might be useful talking about driving in Europe. Um, if people are hoping to come to Europe in particular. Okay. Um, I don't know if anyone's thinking about driving. That's not always the first thing people think. Um, ah, there is a question there. So before, I'll come back to the road trip bit. I may have missed something earlier. This is from Anne. Are there places that are welcoming tourists these days? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely there are. Um, firstly, because I think with <laughs> lots of people are just desperate to see other people i mean some people are frightened but i think this whole lockdown has brought about how important connections are with strangers as much as family i think you know we've missed our family but for me i think one of the saddest moments of the early days of our lockdown was actually you know a guy dropping off a delivery and just this idea that he just puts it on the ground and then backs off and you back off it, it's completely against like a lifetime's body language to just sort of take it and say thank you or shake his hand or you know anything kind of like that so i think in general people miss signs of life and and tourists are signs of life i think i mean the travel industry has been decimated <laughs> so financially most people in the travel industry will definitely be glad to have people back 
I would say probably don't be put off. I've seen some horrible stuff on social media, haven't we all, um, about, about people complaining, particularly about Americans or Canadians coming across to their country. And I think those are probably outliers and it probably comes from jealousy. I think I saw some stuff, particularly in Ireland, when people in Ireland weren't allowed to leave but international tourists were allowed to come in and so i think that created a sort of slight conflict with people you know well how, how come our freedoms are restricted but other people can come in um but i think that's few and fair between i mean i think i like to hope still europe's a very welcoming place um and we're desperate to have people back i think we're all desperate to to open up safely um yeah, so don't let that don't let that put you off. Yeah, I, I, um, I you know, look at each country on an individual basis of where you yeah. want to go, and yeah. if it's open to you, they want you, because yes, yeah. travel oh, industry God. has been hurt incredibly badly. Yeah, and so I mean, to an extent, so I've done some small trips just in the UK um, since our lockdown was lifted. You still can't eat in restaurants and things, so it was a bit odd, but it almost felt it was so emotional. It was so brilliant to get to this hotel or this farm stay. You know, I went to a farm nature in the middle of nowhere with my daughter and it was so emotional for both of us. They were so happy to see us and me to see them. You know, you're back, you're alive, you've survived. Um, we're all going to be okay. You know, this horrible thing It's a very shared experience for the first time, isn't it? Around the world and to see tourists and to travel is just a reminder of that. We've taken a step towards hope and yeah. life and not just kind of living in fear really so i think you'd probably be quite surprised i think you're more likely to get a really warm reaction with people you know so glad to have you back it's like going to a country that's never had tourists before i think <laughs> um, you know when people are just excited and interested and and how was it where you were you know what was it like how was lockdown you know all of that actually that socially distanced but small talk is really um yeah a real icebreaker i think yeah. Well, there's been a common experience internationally, and, yeah. yet, and yet a different experience internationally. So yeah. it's, it's, uh, yeah. it creates a lot of conversation for sure. Yeah, yeah. I see another question, oh, another two. Um, I'll read out this, so tourism in Germany has been mostly national. Um, lakes, countryside hotels and resorts are booming. Yeah, most people want to be out in nature. I think that's probably Maybe I'm not alone then as well, particularly if you've been in a city in a block with one small park, kind of walking around like a, yeah, like a hamster. Um, a question from Laura. What about taking an escorted tour? Hmm. Um, I think it depends on the tour. So let me think through this. I love small tours with local people and I think that would be easily done socially distanced, you know, a small food tour or perhaps a cooking lesson or something like that. An escorted tour where you're in a coach, um, you're obviously going to be at an increased risk than if you're in a smaller group. But if you're in the same group, and if that group of people are generally sensible, then that might well be a kind of manageable, you know, manageable risk. It would be like joining an extended household. Um, I don't know if you've had those or like it's, extended bubble, social bubbles that we're, we have expanding in the it. bubble expanding the bubble yeah. this is actually a topic that we are going to address uh we did a poll amongst uh the group and the first one was insurance so we're going to be uh, addressing oh, yeah. insurance uh in september and then in october we're going to address the idea of an escorted tour and uh and in both cases going into the industry and trying to pull out exactly what um, what is the gold standard so that people know what to look for and, mm -hmm. and also what are some of the, the things that companies are doing specifically. So, um, so we'll be addressing that down the road as well. Okay, that's great. Um, smaller the better, I guess, is the general rule of thumb. But, um, the, you know, there's, there are two sides to the whole thing of a tour. We, because from a coronavirus issue in terms of your own personal health, it can be tricky, like you said, smaller the better. But on the other side, if anything were to happen, you've got 
a tour manager who is there to take care of all sorts of things. Yeah. So, right. So, so uh, I think it's a really interesting area to explore. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it's their job to keep on touch. Yeah. Keep up to date with the changing legislation. That's true. I, I was in Morocco in March and they were closing the airports. Um, the, uh, I guess that it was supposed to close the day before we, our departure date. And, uh, you know, our tour manager was working to get us on the, on flights before that. Oh. They did extend how long they were going to go to the airport, but watching the tour manager work this issue was extraordinary. So, yeah. you know, that I, you know, I felt that that was a really, real um, value to have be on an escorted tour at that point. No, that's absolutely true. Um, and just reminds me, because I, I do normally travel independently, partly because it's been my job for so long. I kind of just like can do it without thinking. But a few times when I have been with tours or even if you are on your own, but you've booked it through a tour agency and something goes wrong, you know, strikes or whatever else. Um, you know, storm in Europe it is actually so lovely. It's the ultimate luxury to just go help, sort it out, <laughs> you know, and um, carry on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah having yeah. that backup is really, really, really valuable. Yeah. Uh, do we have any more questions? Because we really need to get wrapped up here. This has gone uh, well, been really well. It's been really interesting, Abby. Uh, are, we about, are we about good? You know, if you do have questions, I'm sure that um, that we can, uh, if they come up to you afterwards, please, you know, me message me within the Insider Patreon group and I'll collect any and get them off to Abby and then maybe put together a post so that everyone can see the answers. Uh, so if there are any things that pop into mind, just shoot me a message. Uh, now, Abby, I really would like you to talk a, a little bit more about what it is you do on a daily basis. And the one thing I really want you to talk about is we must be the change. Wow, Janice, thank you. So um, I run the travel blog inside the Travel Lab and we focus on what I kind of try and call authentic luxury travel. So it's people who aren't shy to spare the money on the experiences that they want. But it is all about the experience rather than the price tag. They're not particularly interested in shopping to just have an expensive item. Um, but if they could pay to see the Sistine Chapel with no one else in the room, then they, they would, that kind of sort of thing. Um, and I've been doing that for 10 years. And I also run writing workshops because I miss teaching from my medical days and before. And I realized that I enjoy it and I can help people with it. And I've sort of loved seeing people launch their own careers as they come through the writing course so that's that and then be the change i was actually really surprised when you um asked me about that janice um uh, maybe you'd explain it better it, it's um so the black lives matter protest that i'm sure everybody's seen came hit the new screen this year really stopped me in my tracks because I felt very much like my life and the work that I do is aimed at including people and understanding people in the world. And there was something about this protest and seeing the arguments about it online that really made me stop and think and think, well, maybe, maybe I'm not doing it right, actually. Maybe there are things I've missed. And in fact, not maybe, there definitely are. Uh, so even though I think I'm a decent person and the people I hang around with and work with are and readers are, there's actually, I need to, to stop and think about this somehow, but it was locked down. I have a three-year-old. I didn't have much stop and think headspace. So I started on my weekly newsletter. I just wanted a bite-sized thing that we could stop and think about and then do something about. And that's really the two things that have led this change. And it is a little bit about how, um, how black people in America are treated, but it's much more than that because the issue of systemic racism is certainly not, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's beyond laughable if it wasn't such a sad subject. It's certainly not a US problem and it's not just about race either, is it's, it's ageism and sexism and all kinds of ways that, that maybe we, you know, are, are not doing as well as we could be. And so I just really wanted to tie it in with action, with a small action, not with necessarily going out and protesting because I couldn't do that with a tiny child. So I was thinking 
what is something I could do every single week? And I'll just, if I put it in my newsletter, it holds me accountable. And, and if I mess up, someone will let me know, right? On social media, no mistake goes unpunished. If I've done something, if I've accidentally, I mean, it's all accidental, but if I've accidentally offended somebody, this is probably the best way to find out, right? So, and then I will learn and get better and it feels horrible and uncomfortable, but it seems that that's what we need. So, so that's it. And I've had hardly any feedback at all. <laughs> it's just like gone out every week and like this little ghost thing that I'm doing, just me and the computer. Um, so I was amazed when you popped up and uh, I said, I've had, there's been a few small discussions, but not, not much. Um, well, so what, what I like about it is that it truly is humble. It's a very, it, they're short, they're clearly written, they're, uh, they're bite-sized, and they're thought-provoking. And I think that, uh, so I think that they're just, I, I think they're really great. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. It's always, yeah, it's always lovely. You never know, do you, whenever you go on a video, or any of us, or, or write, or publish anything, you never really know who's, who's on the other side of it. But I felt that what I felt was missing was, a lot of the advice was that the kind of people that I don't think most of us think we are, you know, the people who go out and do deliberately hateful, unpleasant things, but that there was more to it than that. Um, and I was trying to unravel it. So anyway, I will be keeping it. Yeah, I'll be keeping it going. Um, the newsletter's free if you want to take a look. If you disagree or you don't like it, that's fine. Unsubscribe. It's <laughs> 10 years in the business. I've got a thicker skin than when I started. It's fine. So tell people where they can follow you in terms of social media, inside the Travel Lab. Um, yeah, so inside the Travel Lab um, is the blog and Facebook account. Inside Travel Lab with no the, this was a terrible mistake 10 years ago, um, is Instagram and Twitter. And if you go to those, you should be able to find the travel stuff, the Be The Change and um, the write. If you're interested in the writing creativity, side of things then that's there as well great great and i will send the link across of the list of travel gear as well i'll do that right now after this call ends yeah yeah and we'll share that with uh with the video so thank you so much for sharing you know your enthusiasm for travel and your expertise from a medical perspective to help us travel safely during this time i really appreciate it Thank you all for listening. I know I talked a lot more than I thought I would be, actually. So I hope if you missed a question, please, I will reply afterwards and I'll check. But yeah, very passionate about travel and all the things we've talked about. So yeah. Good. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We really appreciate it. And we'll get this posted soon. Mwah to you too. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.